And with that, we are at the top of the hour and now introducing. Oh, oh, oh. Greetings all. I appreciate you being here for what might not sound like the most scintillatingly fascinating talk of this conference, frequency estimation. True, this is a math topic. This is the underlying math of ham-sized WWV investigations. I will try to make this an entertaining talk with a bit of history, a bit of fun behind it, but yeah, ultimately, it's a math talk. Let's see how it goes. I want to thank Tapper. I've been using Tepper stuff, their publications and their products, since the mid-80s when I ran a packet bulletin board in Michigan. And I want to thank the American Radio Relay League for all of their decades of coaching and publications and running W1AW and all the rest of amateur radio. Uh, got me started in the 60s with this little book, and it's been a fun ride ever since. I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues from the Case Amateur Radio Club and from Hamside for making it interesting now. And I want to thank the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the staff of WWV and of WW0WWV and of all the world's other national physics laboratories. We have had good friendship and correspondence with them, and they are making it all possible. All right, what's the frequency estimation problem? We do this every day all the time. You listen to speech, you listen to music, you listen to CW signals, you look at a picture and you want to know what the colors are. Frequency estimation is part of the everyday experience of the world. Here's a waterfall, it's turned 90 degrees, but it's still a waterfall of piano music. You can see the attacks and the decays, you can see the frequency slotting of the individual strings on the piano as they're being struck. It's not that much different from what we were doing with WWV monitoring. If you started in CW back in the day, you know what it's like to use a not very selective receiver and try to figure out your signal's sound as it's contaminated with noise, with static, with lightning flashes, and with all the other CW signals out there. It's yet another version of a neurologic frequency estimation problem. I will make an assertion that the statistical problem of frequency estimation might be a part of engineering college statistics. And I think these classes would be more interesting if we all participated in the frequency measuring test. Twice a year, the ARL runs this. It's about 120 amateurs enter. This is the nerdiest of the nerdy of amateur radio competition. And I got to tell you, with WADU, the Case Amateur Radio Club, we love it. It's amazing how hard your heart can pound during two minutes of key down. The FMT itself goes back. Amateurs are supposed to stay within band edges till you need your equipment calibrated. WNAW used to send standard signals. Then they started asking volunteer amateurs to monitor the bands so that perhaps they could anticipate FCC regulatory actions mostly for fun and scientific interest now because transmitters are so well calibrated. W5CN essentially reproduces WWV in his basement, sends out unknown signals. The contest is maybe akin to penny pitching. Whoever gets the penny closest to the wall gets to scoop up all the other frequencies. Does that make sense? And wins. Does it on three different bands. And the winning scores these days are within 10 millihertz. It's really pretty amazing. The only apparent rule is that you don't bribe the referee. It kind of keeps the referee anonymous, so it's harder than it might be. Otherwise, you bring your equipment and your skills and your experience to this, and may the best frequency measurement win. It's fun. But for Hamsai, the frequency estimation has real significance. The beacons, WWV, CHU, mics in Finland, they launch their signals with very high accuracy and very good stability. But as they bounce off the ionosphere, they get contaminated. The frequency shifts by Doppler shifting, noise gets added, there's multipath interference. Hamsai wants to use these signals of opportunity to read off the electrocardiogram of the ionosphere. What's going on electrically in the ionosphere that can be measured indirectly? Well, we need good measurements for this. They've got to be high resolution and they've got to be fast. They have to have good statistical power. Now, at first blush, estimating frequency doesn't sound that hard. All right, you have a sine wave coming at you. It's a sine wave about squiggles. All the information, if it's just a sine wave, is contained in the zero crossings. 
every time the signal goes from negative to positive, count. Start a stopwatch, count. At the end of a second, stop counting, report the number. Well, it doesn't sound that hard, but it certainly can be. You're given the signal of single frequency and constant amplitude, but you're also given it contaminated with noise. And in fact, there might be fade. That amplitude might not be that constant. So now, what's the best statistical estimator of the signal frequency? Well, the earliest version of this was lecture lines, parallel conductive transmission lines that were set up deliberately to have high SWR. You use a light bulb, you measure the distance, the physical distance with a meter stick between SWR peaks, between voltage peaks, and read off the wavelength. All right, if you need to convert that to frequency, you do, but otherwise, you measure the wavelength of the signal. You can do it to about 1% with a system like this, and that's how the original radio regulations were written. Next up was tuned LC circuits. It's just an inductor and a capacitor resonating against each other, and the voltage is measured. You dial it, you have a calibration curve, you can get within about 0.1% this way. All right, part of a thousand. The next step was header dining receivers. If you have an accurate crystal running a local oscillator and you get to mix it down, it comes out of a speaker, maybe then you can use a tuning fork, which actually is surprisingly accurate. And by ear, with the help of a meter, maybe, you can get about 10 hertz accuracy. So at a megahertz, 10 hertz accuracy on an unknown, that's a part in 10 to the fifth. It's starting to get pretty good. This World War II device was used for a lot of FMTs back in the day. The official observers all had them. But we've got computers now, and we have NIST. They're running atomic clocks. They disseminate the atomic clocks with GPS-disciplined oscillators. By the way, there's a very cool book on history of crystals. So we should be able to do a whole lot better. How do we do it? All right, here's a signal. This is what comes out of the speaker of your radio. It's a sine wave contaminated with noise. It's maybe a couple of decibels above the noise, so it's got lots of squiggles contaminating it. What's the first thing you do? Well, put it through a bandpass filter. So the blue is the signal, the red is the bandpass version. It looks a whole lot more like a sinusoid, but it's still not a sinusoid. It's contaminated in noise. The underlying math of it then is that you have a sinusoid, a theoretically pristinely perfect sinusoid at one frequency that has an amplitude, some number of volts, it's contaminated by additive white Gaussian noise, uncorrelated noise. All of the information of the sine wave part is contained in zero crossings. So let's see what we would do with an FM receiver's limiting amplifier. Well, that's a frequency counter. We've all seen and used frequency counters. They're certainly a whole lot better if they have mixy tubes. We like mixy tubes. Uh, we haven't quite run the FMT yet. Let's take a look. The idea of a frequency counter is that the sine wave gets squared off. The squaring amplifier leaves behind only the zero crossing information. WWV and the NIST come in in generating an accurate time base essentially to run the stopwatch. The time between the rising edge that will control the gate and the falling edge that will stop the signal passing through the gate has to be precise. If you use a GPS DO to run it, you can get it to about part 10 to the 12. All right, you open the gate, you read off squiggles, count them one by one, you close the gate, whatever is left, you display. That's the frequency. It's very comforting to have a digital frequency displayed on a digital display. It must be correct, it's digital. The problem is noise might create more zero crossings. If you're having a bad day, it might be that those high frequency squiggles or those poorly filtered squiggles of the noise will be right at the zero point and will cause erroneous counts. The second problem is that in one second, you only get to count one hertz precision. This is an integer counting. So every additional count counts up one more hertz. In one second gating, there won't be fractional hertz. There won't be fractional zero crossings. It's not good enough for ham sign, and also it's not good enough for Connie either. Well, it is about a tenth of a part per million error, though. So we have improved on things. We're doing better than the BC221 did. Can you filter it well enough? Can you fil filter the signal coming out the speaker output of your receiver well enough to use a frequency counter? 
you're going to need awfully high speed filter for this if you're doing it at the actual radio frequency. A Q of a million is really hard to attain. It's hard to tune. And you want to win. So you're going to have 10 second gating times, 100 second gating times. Connie only goes P down for two minutes and the ionosphere is changing during that time. You won't be able to find the signal fast enough. So maybe this isn't exactly the right approach. Down conversion can help. That's the BC221 approach. If you have a high quality local oscillator, this is where calibration against an IST or the GPSBO comes in. You have your incoming signal, you mix it down. Now you have an audio level signal, say a low IF, maybe a kilohertz. And you still can use a frequency counter. It still has the time frequency trade off. One second only gives you one hertz precision. You still have it won the FMT. This is a really odd graphic I found somewhere. Who's selling ham radio jigsaw puzzles? Okay. The FL Digi analysis mode, FL Digi, more or less does this. It does a time domain computation where you set the cursor, it generates a signal at the cursor, your best guess, mixes the incoming signal down, and measures accumulated phase error during the measuring time. Well, actually, that's a way of statistically improving on the inverse gating time precision problem. It's not a bad approach. You can get tenth of a hertz, hundredth of a hertz this way. It turns out not to behave well in noise. This is what the screen looks like. This is WWV's carrier, and we've set the cursor there. So we have our receiver set a kilohertz down. We've set the cursor at one kilohertz. So the estimation is 10 megahertz. And we're measuring now our error against the zero line. It's not a bad way to do it. WADDU has nearly won the FMT this way. But you want to get rid of as much of the noise as you can. You want your estimator to be zero biased, and you want it to be close to the Raoul Kramer lower bound, to have as low variance, as low standard deviation as you can possibly get. Well, let's go to the frequency domain methods then. Now, you collect samples for a second. You don't take a sample and just do something with it. You collect them and compare all of the seconds against each other. That's the notion of a discrete Fourier transform. It may be that in a discrete Fourier transform, in this example, we have three signals in the frequency window. Each is a sine wave of same amplitude of constant frequency. They get transformed in the frequency domain. They've had noise added to them. So you have noise under here, but you do have three distinct spikes. So maybe you can just read off the digital frequency bins that have the most amplitude, read off the spikes, and report those as your estimated frequency. Actually, you got the same problem that you did with a frequency counter. The bins are too wide. They don't, if you've read one second of data, you only have one hertz wide bins. You need more math. The DFT filters are more or less a digital inner ear. Each one has its own Q. Frequency resolution is Q. Well, okay, you have one hertz wide bins, but you haven't discarded all of the information on either side of the bins the way that the FM detectors limiting amplifier did. You did a whole pile of linear math and you've retained a lot of information. So what can we do with it? Steve Serwin collected data for a longer period of time in an overlap way. So he had a running averaging system of frequency with higher resolution. You get time smudging, but you do get frequency detail. Let's take a look at what he did. At night, time's advancing up. At night, the ionosphere looked unstable. Day broke, there was a Doppler shift up. In fact, there was a second Doppler shift, maybe from another forming layer of the ionosphere. As those layers were coming down and the path was shortening, there was high frequency shift. As the path shortening slows, both of these converge back on the stable frequency at 10 megahertz. And finally, as the ionosphere stabilizes during the day, the 10 megahertz signal becomes stable and you get back to reading only one frequency. You get 10 hertz, I'm sorry, you get 10th of a hertz resolution for 10 second windows in overlapping them 
you get a running average in short time intervals, but it's still a running average. It's the average of frequencies over the interval, and you don't get to do very fine frequency resolution and very fine time resolution simultaneously. There's another way of doing it, though. You don't have to use linear approaches. A statistical method that uses nonlinear approaches is a data compression in the same sense that taking the average of a bunch of data is a data compression. Taking the standard deviation of a bunch of data gives you more information than just the average, but it's still compressed data. You haven't retained all of the separate information from all of the separate data points. So let's take a look at uh, a quick example of this. We have one second of sampling here. So we have one hertz wide bins. A 50 hertz signal gets exactly in the center of a bin. That's the blue here. It's the spike, that pointer is red, I'm sorry, but the blue spike here has all of the energy contained within it. The blues below it and above it are all exactly zero. The purple spike from frequency just a tick above it is the lower spike because it has spilled some of its energy into higher frequencies and into lower frequencies. You notice that the distribution here isn't symmetric. Well, okay, of course it's not symmetric because you have a 50.1 is just into the next bin. Well, zoom in on this. Let's do an interpolation. Let's do a parabolic best fit from the point below, the point above, and the point itself. That's an exact parabola that will give a peak just above the peak that's here, just above in frequency to the peak that's here. And in fact, if there's no noise and everything is done mathematically perfectly, the peak of the parabola will in fact be at 50.1 hertz. If there's noise, then these will be bobbling around. So you may want to include more points and do a least squares best fit parabola, read off the peak of it to approximate the 50.1. Now it's a statistical problem. Your least squares best fit might not be exactly 50.1. It will have non-zero variance, but it may be pretty close, and really that's not a bad starting point for all of this, drawing a spline. The new FL Digi FMT mode, the Frequency Measurement Test mode, for which we give credit for a lot of code work by David Priest, W1HKJ, the maintainer of FL Digi, it uses a different nonlinear approach. The parabolic spline is not bad, but this one, it's not what he uses. He's now using this work by Tsui and Reisenfeld, two Australian electrical engineers, who use a mathematically rather involved approach that's not within the scope of this talk, but we'll see to it that it's uploaded to the Tepper uh, reservoir of papers repository of papers, and uh, you'll be able to read it on your own. It uses a nonlinear and recursive estimation method that turns out to do frequency, phase, and amplitude all in the same measurement, and demonstrably it gives it very close to the statistical, theoretical, best possible estimation. It hits what's called the Rao Kramer lower bound within only a few estimations, few recursions, and is the current version of this. Here is the new FL Digi screen. I don't have data on this one, but this is what the screen looks like. And in fact, with this, people are now winning the FMTs at precisions somewhere between a millihertz and 10 millihertz. With modern equipment, it's really quite a substantial improvement using modern math. Okay, how are you going to estimate your frequency? Make sure you're asking the right question. Is your signal high amplitude, noise-free, stable, perfect, everything else? You know, somebody's just using frequency counter. If you're at a test bench and you want to measure the frequency of your two-meter handheld, a well-calibrated frequency counter is what you want. If you're trying to measure a signal in noise, it's a different story. Probably discrete Fourier transform techniques with long time averaging will be what you're after. They will give resolution, your signal stable. If your signal is noisy and has only short-term stability, but it's single frequency within those short terms, a nonlinear DFT technique might be good. And maybe there's a way of using several of these simultaneously across the spectrum. That's what the newest FMT does. But you know something? You can't have it all, all the time. You're going to have some trade-off of frequency precision 
and localization of transient effects in time. That's the HAMSI WWV problem, and it's not a solved problem. If you want to join us, if you're the mathematician here, get to work, do some research with us, write a paper on it, be famous. You get to do next year's ARL TAP or HAMSI program. There's a lot of background work to this, and we'll guide you through it. One of my professors, Jerry Lefton, used to say, more data, more noise. It's the stuff of physical measurements outside of the math realm itself. The wisdom of Bob Leskovic, who is a senior member of WADDU, everything must be done first. We're all still doing our homework here. I want to close by saying outside my office here where I'm recording this, at night the crickets are singing. The crickets are singing, summer's over. Everyone stay healthy as the nights get longer and you're more indoors. Stay healthy in the days of the virus. Enjoy this conference, and I hope we all get to meet in person next year. I hope the days of the virus are over soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you for your kind audience, and if there are any questions, I'll be around for a bit. And with that, David. So, David, there were some questions, uh, some discussion on the chat room about how you pick 30 megahertz IF. Is there anything more you wanted to add to that? You have to unmute. I need to unmute. Thank you. It's the old guy's problem. Um, I, I'm not sure that we did choose 30 megahertz IF. Did I mis misstate something there? Our, this is a low IF receiver. It's not direct conversion, but it's low IF. So in the fully, fully simplified form that we are using in the grape receiver, the local oscillator is one kilohertz offset from the signal that we wish to evaluate. And the low IF then is one kilohertz. Does that answer the question? Oh, from radar days, 30 megahertz is the standard. I'm sorry. Um, I have seen that. I don't know why 30 megahertz was chosen. Um, I'm riffing through my head of when I took the radar endorsement on my commercial radio telegraph license test. Uh, I think 30 or 60. I'm not sure there is a single standard for radar IF. Um, let, let's do some checking. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer. Okay, as I said, it's a math topic. At least some people actually stayed awake through it, and I appreciate that. It's an interesting topic. All right, as long as we have a minute, then nobody's asking. Um, one of the interesting parts of the problem, if you have identified multiple frequency streaks, the way that Steve Serwin did, you can't do it by hand. You have to automate You have to have a statistical test that reports back is there unimodal data or are the data multimodal? And it turns out that's a nasty problem in hypothesis testing statistics. And that's why I said in the last couple of slides, this is a remarkably unsolved problem. And I hope that some better mathematicians out there can give us a hand. I think the basic approach is going to be using that last algorithm that I mentioned, the Tzvi and Rosenfeld recursive algorithm. But having alongside it a sample-by-sample -sample examination of multimodality and bring multiple decoding channels when the multimodality is detected. But I want to say again, this is a nasty statistical problem. It's not an enormous statistical literature, the examination of multimodality in a data set. And even some of the hardcore statistics authors say often it's better to use your intuition here. Yeah, so, David, there's another question on which windowing function you used in the FFT. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It, Sweet and Rosenfeld did specify one, and I don't remember if it was a Hemming or a raised cosine. I'm not sure that it makes a great deal of difference. Once you have chosen a window other than the square, in all honesty, there isn't that much frequency leakage from one side to the other. 
and what is the possible frequency error in a root WWV signal? Um, if what you mean is the ground wave, how accurate they are launching the signal, they're pretty much guaranteeing these days, apart from 10 to the 12th, when the F2 atomic fountain is working and they have a proper microwave signal from the national, from the time and frequency division of NIST from Boulder. I think on an excellent day, they can hit 10 to the 16th. CHU Canada is guaranteeing 10 to the 12th, and I think that's what most of the national standards transmitters are doing. And the FMT is great fun. I encourage you to give it a try. The official ARRL one is twice a year, but there is a pre-FMT, a practice one that is run at least once a month, and there's a practice practice one that's being run twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday evenings. Uh, sign up for the FM Nuts mailing list on Google Groups if you want to participate in that. A surprisingly active group. Who knew? Yep. You got uh, several uh, kudos on YouTube. They very good talk. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. And I hope this is of interest. I hope you want to join us. I've already gotten several Hamside new membership requests that I've signed off on during the conference, especially from Christina's talk. Well, very good. And we also have uh, uh, John Gibbons, N8OBJ, uh, with his mic active, uh, ready to start his presentation in about a half a minute.